Hello everyone and welcome to this month's webinar from the PCPLD network. I'm Irene Tafrivena and I'm your host again for today. And again, so many of you are watching us this, not just in the UK, but all over the world. So you're all really very, very welcome. Now, today's topic is, is not an easy one. In fact, I think this is the most difficult and harrowing that we've had to prepare. Um, we've been talking a lot in previous webinars about, you know, how to anticipate and plan and, you know, for the end of life. And that's important that people with learning disabilities get the care and the support they need when they die. But part of that is to ensure that people don't die before their time. So today we're going to listen to the stories of two young men, Oliver McGowan and Richard Handley, who should still be alive. Their mothers, Paula McGowan and Sheila Handley, will tell us their stories of their son's lives and their utterly, utterly preventable deaths. And both these deaths have been in the news. So we just start each of their stories with a TV news clip um, from that time. Now, Oliver's and Richard's stories are harrowing. I have to say, I cried really again when, again when I hear these stories, but we need to hear them and we need to learn from them. And after telling their some stories, there'll be a bit of time for discussion. We've got Sheila and also Richard's brother, um, Emily, here with us to talk about the implications of Richard's deaths. Um, in implications for all of us. The webinar is recorded. It will be available on YouTube and on our website. If you are watching this live, then please use the Q&A box to share your comments, your questions, your experiences. We have Sharon behind the scenes monitoring the Q&A and Gemma, our chair um, of the network, is live tweeting. So if you're on Twitter, then please join her. And as usual, Anastasia is doing all her wizardry with the technical side and as usual, again, a huge thank you to Kingston and St George's University for their support hosting our webinars. But now let me introduce Paula McGowan and her son Oliver, who died in 2016 at the age of 18. Now, many of you will actually have heard Paula talk before, because since Oliver's death, Paula has spearheaded an extraordinary campaign securing a government commitment that all healthcare staff are given training and learning um, in learning disability and autism. And that's called the Oliver McGowan mandatory training. But even if you've heard Paula tell Oliver's story before, it doesn't matter, please listen to it again. Every time I listen to Paula, it sinks in more. So I urge you all to really listen. And when you listen to her story and later on to Sheila as well, think about the implications of what happened to Oliver and Richard. You know, why did it happen? Could it happen again? Could it happen to you? What is your role in this? Irrespective of whether you've got autism and learning disabilities, you, you know, you have the right to the same level of healthcare outcomes as everybody else. Oliver was great fun. He was just full of life. He was an absolute joy and pleasure to be around. Oliver had high functioning autism, which um, made his autism not always obvious to people that didn't know him. They started to speak in medical jargon. They all spoke over him. So he was sat down and they were stood up over him. And they made the situation far worse by making him more frightened. Sadly, Oliver had made it very clear in A&E and in the ambulance that he was not to be given antipsychotics because they made his brain go funny and his eyes go up. And we said that ourselves over and over again to all medical doctors, nurses, that he was not to be given those medications. Words that were used were, his brain is so badly swollen, it's coming out the base of the skull. So I was sat down one day and I just thought to myself, well, actually, what was the catalyst of Oliver's death? 
and it was clear and simple that the medics didn't understand autism and learning disabilities. We can't expect doctors and nurses to suddenly know how to do these things if they've never had the training. To me, that's not acceptable and it's unreasonable. Things have to change. We need equality for all people. And you know, irrespective of whether you've got autism and learning disabilities, you, you know, you have the right to the same level of healthcare outcomes as everybody else. From the moment Oliver was born, we absolutely knew that he was special and our love for him was just overwhelming. Now, Oliver was born a month premature and at three weeks of age, he developed bacterial meningitis. And as a result of an infarction or, you know, a stroke, Oliver was left with a mild hemiplegia, so cerebral palsy, focal partial epilepsy, and later on a diagnosis of a mild learning disability and also autism. But you know, Oliver's disabilities didn't hold him back. He had the most amazing can-do attitude. He played for England FA development football squads. He was a registered athlete and he was ranked third best in the UK for track 200 metres. Oliver was in fact being trained to become a Paralympian. He was a natural leader and he became a prefect at school. He attained and passed his GCSE examinations. And he went on to attend National Star College in Cheltenham. They talked about his wicked sense of humour, this humour that we absolutely loved. He was so witty and so quick. As you can see, Oliver brought so much fun and happiness to our lives. He always saw the best in everything and taught us all how to challenge our own subconscious biases. He never failed to light up the room with the sound of his laughter. Now, Despite his limitations, Oliver never complained. He wasn't a whinger. He never asked why, why me? You know, his courage and enthusiasm was just, it was just inspirational. Now, importantly, we were told by Oliver's neurologist that he would have a full life expectancy and he would live an independent life and would just, he would just need a small amount of support for things like money matters. In October 15, Oliver was admitted to a children's hospital having simple partial seizures, so something he'd had all his life as a result of that meningitis. Oliver always remained fully conscious throughout the seizures. It was part of the seizure presentation, and quite rightly so, he would be scared and confused. Who wouldn't be? After several weeks of tests, Oliver was discharged home. And for the first time in Oliver's life, he was given an antidepressant medication. And we were told it was to treat his anxiety when a seizure. Now, we were surprised because Oliver wasn't depressed. He wasn't depressed at all. He absolutely loved life. And once this medication was increased to a therapeutic dose, it caused a change to Oliver's mood and increased his seizures greatly. No side effects of that very medication. And as a result of these seizures, Oliver was admitted back into the same hospital in December 15. But this time, Oliver was given antipsychotic medications. But Oliver didn't have a mental illness. He didn't have a mental health illness. Nor did he have psychosis. We couldn't understand why he was being prescribed antipsychotic medications. And we wondered, we wondered, you know, were the doctors misunderstanding Oliver's normal autistic behaviours. And we tried to explain to them about this, but they didn't want to consider Oliver's views or ours either. And the effect of the antipsychotic medication on Oliver was absolutely catastrophic. Oliver's seizure threshold and agitation deteriorated and we absolutely didn't recognise our once vibrant son. We were absolutely terrified at the sudden changes in Oliver as well as was Oliver himself. Now, after numerous complaints, 
doctors at long last agreed to remove the antipsychotic medications and within days, and I mean days, Oliver's mood and seizure activity returned to normal, so much so that Oliver was discharged back home and into our care. A child and adolescent mental health psychiatrist from the CAMS unit wrote that Oliver was sensitive to antipsychotic medications. In April 15, Oliver was readmitted back into the same hospital, again having the same simple partial seizures. And again, he presented in exactly the same way. He was scared and he was confused. Unbelievably, previous lessons had not been learned. And Oliver was again given antipsychotic medications, but this time, one or more of which caused an ocular gyric crisis, which is a serious dystonic side effect that caused Oliver's eyes to roll backwards and his face became frozen. Oliver was left like this for six long, painful hours. As I heard the neurologist in the doorway talking to other clinicians saying she believed Oliver was making it up, that it was behavioural. When she realised after six long, painful hours that Oliver wasn't making it up, she administered procyclidine, which took 15 to 20 seconds to work. Those six long, painful hours could have been avoided for Oliver. Oliver did not present with challenging behaviour and he would never have displayed behaviours such as this. He was absolutely terrified. He was traumatised, as were we. As a result of the antipsychotic medications, Oliver's mood changed significantly. He was now hallucinating. He was having up to 30 seizures a day, something we'd never seen happen before. He now had problems urinating. He had extreme high blood pressure readings. He was sweating, all of which we believed to be linked to this medication. It was obvious that these particular doctors and nurses, and I say just these because I know not everybody's the same, far from it, but these particular doctors and nurses had little to no understanding of learning disability, autism, or how autistic behaviours could present in a person with ongoing seizures. Now, at my request, Oliver was transferred to an adult specialist neurology hospital who I thought would have understood Oliver's epilepsy better. And Oliver was provided with a letter stating his previous reactions to those antipsychotic medications. Now, as part of Oliver's seizure presentation, he needed to walk around, but this was not deemed acceptable by the nursing staff. And as a result, every time Oliver tried to stand up to walk around, the use of physical restraints was increased with up to eight members of staff being involved. Oliver was suddenly not allowed any privacy with his personal care. So every time he went to the toilet, he had three female staff members stood over him. Can you imagine how that would feel for any one of you? Oliver was incredibly proud. He was very aware of himself. Oliver was very, very frightened. And for the first time in his life, he told me just just how scared the staff was making him feel. Oliver was again given different antipsychotic medications and as a consequence of this, he was detained against his will and transferred to a mental health hospital. Again, nobody thought to explain to Oliver, you know, what to expect. We were absolutely terrified. But the different approach from the skilled staff allowed Oliver to improve almost instantly and this was simply because they were making reasonable adjustments for Oliver. They were using a hands-off approach. And the words from the staff, including the consultant psychiatrist from the unit were that Oliver was not psychotic and nor was he mentally ill. And that his placement there was an absolute total misuse of the Mental Health Act. They immediately reduced all of the antipsychotic medications and Oliver was discharged after just a few days into the care of a specialist learning disability team and again with a letter saying that he was sensitive to antipsychotic medications and this time benzodiazepines. But in October 16, Oliver had another cluster of focal partial seizures and this time he was admitted to a different general hospital. This time we were prepared. And we gave the neurologist a small file of supporting letters, including a hospital passport, stating Oliver's previous adverse reactions to antipsychotic medications. 
and this was subsequently written in bold red ink on Oliver's medical care sheets and drug charts that he was intolerant to all forms of antipsychotic medications. And he even followed this up in an email to all doctors treating Oliver. Oliver was intubated to facilitate an MRI scan to see why he was having seizures. And a safeguarding officer was consulted on how to manage Oliver's anxiety when sedation was reduced. After consultation with ourselves and looking through those previous letters, his advice to the doctors was an absolute non-pharmaceutical approach. And we were told that we absolutely should be present when sedation was reduced so that we'd be able to reassure and comfort Oliver. This advice wasn't listened to. And sedation was reduced while we weren't there. Can you imagine how Oliver would have felt waking up to find tubes down his throat? Crowds of people stood over him that he didn't know. That was also the last opportunity I had to look my son in the eye and tell him just how much I loved him and that he was there because of his seizures and that he was safe and that everything was going to be okay. But it wasn't okay, was it? Oliver had made an advanced verbal decision stating to ambulance staff and doctors in A&E that he was not to be given antipsychotic medications and he gave good reasons saying they mess with my brain and they make my eyes roll up. Oliver clearly had capacity to be able to refer back to the dystonic reaction he'd had just a few months previously. Now despite this and without our knowledge Oliver was given antipsychotic medication that evening. Over the next few days, Oliver developed a temperature of 43 degrees. The doctors couldn't understand the decline in Oliver's condition and they sent him for a scan of his liver and his lungs. Oliver was now having tonic clonic seizures despite heavy sedation and paralysis drugs. We were terrified, you know, because Oliver didn't have these type of seizures. And it was at this point that we begged the doctors to please do a scan of his brain. And we explained to them that, you know, he couldn't afford any further damage to his brain. And we were told not to be concerned. They weren't concerned and neither should we. But two days later, doctors told us they were sending um, Oliver for an emergency MRI scan of his brain as one of his pupils was very slow to react. When Oliver returned, we instantly saw the worried expression on the ICU consultant's face. And we were taken to the side room that nobody ever wants to enter. And we were told that Oliver's brain was so badly swollen, it was bulging at the base of his skull. The neurosurgeons and the emergency doctors told us Oliver had neuroleptic malignant syndrome, a serious side effect of those very antipsychotic medications that Oliver had asked not to be given. We were told that Oliver's brain was now so badly damaged that he would be profoundly disabled. There'd be no more speech. There was no more understanding of language. He'd have no way of communicating. Oliver would now be reliant on a tracheotomy and he'd be tube fed for the rest of his life. My boy, my Oliver was now paralyzed. There was no more representing his country in athletics or football. That beautiful smile, that sense of humor, and those wise, wise words of wisdom. They were gone forever. My boy was silenced. A week later, the decision was made to turn Oliver's life support machines off. And Oliver passed away several days later on Armistice Day, the 11th of November, 2016, which for us is poignant. Given Oliver was a military child and had lived his life as part of the Royal Air Force family. Thank you, Paula, for sharing Oliver's story. It's just devastating. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how often I listen to this. Actually, I think, it, in fact, it's getting worse every time I listen to it because it really hits me again um, and 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 more fully how how wrong everything was. 
So thank you for doing what you're doing, keeping Oliver's story alive. Now, lots of you will have questions and comments um, for Paula. She can't be here live because she lives in Australia now, so it's the middle of the night there. Um, but I did discuss um, Oliver's story and the implications of that um, with Paula earlier, and we'll share that with you at the end of this webinar. But now let me introduce Richard Handley. Richard um, was 33 when he died in 2012 of constipation. Um, and I am really grateful for his mother, Sheila, um, Sheila Handley, to join us today um, to tell her son's story. Again, not an easy story to listen to, but really, you know, bear with us, it's important. So Sheila, you're very welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to tell us Richard's story. He had a wonderful sense of humour. He loved teasing people. He was just lovely to be around. Richard Handley, who had Down syndrome, lived a full and active life. But at the age of just 33, Richard died from complications related to constipation, a death his parents say was wholly preventable. He's left a big hole in the family, there's no doubt about that. It's not one we can fill again, but, and even after his mental health problems had kicked in, every now and then we could see the old Rich shining through. As he got older, Richard's mental health deteriorated and he was moved to Bonds Meadow Care Home in Suffolk. But when it was turned into a supported living complex, the regular assessments of Richard's dietary needs stopped, making his bowel problems worse. If only we'd known that those changes had been made, we would have recognised that as very dangerous for Richard because I know, he needed that care plan to be in place. Richard died at Ipswich Hospital in 2012. The coroner found his complex health requirements were also neglected here. The coroner said there was a gross failure by the hospital to respond to Richard's needs and get senior staff involved in his care. He also said there was a missed opportunity to provide potentially life-saving treatment. Today, the hospital's chief executive said, I am extremely sorry that we let Richard and his family down in the last 48 hours of his life. I want to give my personal assurance that we have learned from this tragedy and improved the care and support we provide for people with learning disabilities. The chief executive of the charity that ran Richard's care home has also apologised. We are very, very sad, very sorry uh, for Richard's death. And I think that we all have to accept there are things that we should and could have done better. Richard's parents were praised by the coroner for their determination in fighting for the truth. You know, nothing can bring Richard back, but if we can be part of making care for vulnerable people better, then I think we'd, we'd view that as a, as a positive result. As if he hadn't died for no reason at all, yes. Yes, mm. yes. The coroner said if Richard's care had been better coordinated by all the agencies looking after him, his tragic death might have been prevented. Leila Hayes, 5 News, Ipswich. Richard was the firstborn of my three children. He was an absolute delight through his childhood. Basically, he led a full and active life. He always loved being part of all family activities. He enjoyed teasing people, creeping up and tickling them. He had a wonderful sense of humour. He loved holidays, school trips. And as he got older, he really got into his drama group. When he was born, Down syndrome was very quickly confirmed. We spent 10 days in hospital because he just didn't poo. They were on the point of operating when his bowel was cleared. Oh, what a relief. The conclusion was that he could well have Hirschsprung's disease. That, that's where a, a section of bowel wall doesn't work properly, uh, and so it leads to constipation. They said he might eventually need surgery, but there was no talk of any further investigations. It was just a case of wait and see. When he started on solid food, 
that's when the problems with constipation began. We went into a routine of, of Richard needing daily laxatives, a high fiber diet and plenty of fluid. Up, he'd go for days without actually pooing. So I developed a, a bedtime routine where I'd sit on a little stool in front of the toilet and, and just play. We'd play games, sing songs, and it would be action songs, or I'd throw things in the air for him to catch. And by distracting him, it, it would mean that it would help him to, to relax and, uh, and actually manage to do a poo. I mean, I basically made the reasonable adjustments which kept him safe. We saw a gastroenterologist and he concluded that even though Hirschsprung's disease was still suspected, he didn't advise surgery because as a family, we, we were managing the condition. Was this a health inequality? Could Richard's life, long suffering with constipation, have been prevented? We stumbled on for six months. Richard was not right. I described things, but the professionals never saw it for themselves. Nothing was ever done to check for a physical cause. Things eventually became too much. Emergency respite care was arranged. In that four months of respite care, Richard needed manual evacuation of his bowels twice. Richard's diet had deteriorated. His e the evening games on the toilet had stopped. All the family advice about care was ignored. Um, the, the manager of the uh, respite care place thought she knew better. So Richard suffered. The support that they gave to Richard in, in the period where it was the changeover from ATU to care home was absolutely fantastic. Um, the staff, the care home staff, they all worked together with, with Richard and with us to ensure the best outcome for Richard. And for years, things went well. The weekly diet sheet was displayed, bowel charts were kept, manual evacuations were just not needed. Life was great at that stage. Then we had the change to supported living. That's when problems started. Richard started putting on weight. A carer quietly told me that he was being allowed to make poor decisions about his food. His diet was poor. If he wanted a whole pack of sausage rolls at bedtime, okay, fine, he could have them. I met with senior staff. They said, Richard has the right to make unwise decisions, just like everyone else does. Alarm bells rang. He didn't have the capacity to understand the effect of poor diet on his constipation. He was allowed to make many unwise choices. And he quickly learned that he could refuse to do all sorts of things. Um, he wasn't daft. Um, so he'd refuse to get up, have a wash, clean his teeth, eat fruit and veg be supervised when he was pooing and things were just allowed to escalate. They became entrenched behaviours without family or GP ever being told that, that the problems were there. Staff didn't think there was a big problem with constipation anymore despite his daily laxatives. Richard was just allowed to refuse the monitoring to give him privacy. If only I'd known. Care plans mustn't be changed without reference to family and health professionals. 
the GP and psychiatrist didn't have any meaningful com communication with each other, despite both of them prescribing medications that, that had constipation as a side effect, even though they knew that Hirschsprungs were suspected. It was all looked at through the lens of mental health. Despite the known link between mental health and constipation, nobody considered a physical cause of the changes in Richard. If only I'd known that the care plan had been downgraded, I would have known to, to do something about it. Would closer collaboration have saved Richard's life? A very harrowing week. On the Monday, Richard saw the psychiatrist and he expressed concern about the hardness and distension of Richard's abdomen. He advised the carers to get an emergency GP appointment, but he didn't pick up the phone himself, he just left it to the carers to arrange. Richard wasn't seen by a GP until the next day, the Tuesday. He saw a trainee GP who prescribed large doses of laxatives in the next 24 hours. This is despite Richard already being on daily laxatives and despite Hirschsprung's being suspected. Nobody joined up the dots, basically. On the Wednesday, Richard transferred to an ATU. He was almost immediately taken to a and &E and admitted to the hospital. The hospital passport described him as a mostly independent man, despite needing 24-7 care. It didn't mention constipation. This is his hospital passport. It did mention his fear of needles. On Thursday, he was held down screaming while an anaesthetic was given to him, ready for a manual evacuation of his bowels. No reasonable adjustment, such as the use of a pre-med to calm him, was even considered. 10 kilograms of faeces was removed. They assumed that the normal pathway of fluids and laxatives clear the rest, the rest of the blockage and he'd soon be discharged from hospital. On the Friday, Richard passed huge amounts more poo, and then he developed breathing difficulties towards lunchtime. He was put on oxygen. His early warning score went up several times. Senior staff weren't called, so Richard didn't benefit from their greater expertise. The hospital didn't follow their own procedures and protocols. No action was, was really taken until 10 p.m. that Friday night, when the early warning score reached eight. Eight is disaster level. And yet there was no immediate transfer to theater for potentially life-saving treatment. And Richard died just before 2 a.m after going into cardiac arrest while being prepared for surgery. It was just too late. I arrived on the ward in the early hours of Saturday morning to be told that Richard was dead. I've never been so shocked in all my life. I couldn't take it in. I wailed like a wounded animal. A nurse told me several times, I just had to accept that his time had come. At 33, from constipation, he died? A colorectal surgeon said at Richard's inquest, people don't die from faecal impaction. Well, Richard did.
Every day she moves me, steadily improves me. Step by step she helps this body do the things it should. She'll never see me labeled young and disabled. Sometimes she holds me in her arms like any mother would. We don't need your tears. We don't need to hear you cry. I can't run like other children, but we have some laughs when I try. Book, chapter, and pages. Triumph comes in stages. Step by precious step, I count the things that I can do. Now I can jump puddles, can you? I still see his shadow. His laugh lingers on. When I wake, he's gone It's strange here without you This was not meant to be So brother up in heaven Wait up for me You've got the words to change a nation But you're biting your tongue You've spent a lifetime stuck in silence Afraid you'll say something wrong If no one ever hears it How we gonna learn your song So come on, come on Come on, come on You've got a heart as loud as lying So why let your voice be tamed Maybe we Sheila and Paula, I thought I'd watched this before, so I thought I'd be all right, but it sort of hits you every time you listen to this story, every time you see it. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the, on the Q&A. There's been lots and lots of questions and comments from you. A lot of people asking um, about accountability from the staff um, afterwards, about after Paula and um, after Richard and, and Oliver's deaths. We won't go into that too much because, but, but there has been an inquest um, to the, in, in, in both those cases. And, and yes, but I think I'd really like to, to focus really now on, on what it means for us, for you watching this, what we can learn for ourselves. You know, could this happen on, on your watch? There's questions about, um, you know, why are physical difficulties for people with a learning disability so often seen through a mental health lens? Um, and also the importance of sort of family involvement. So Sheila, thank you so much for, for, for telling that story and also for managing to, to join us live today. Um, I wonder whether you can just say a little bit more about, um, not, you know, lots of people in the, in the chat have commented that families are just still not listened to when, when, you know, about the care of the people that they love and support. Can you say a little bit more about that, about the way your family was or wasn't listened to when when Richard was in these in these 
other places? Yes. I mean, it's it's a very interesting question, really, because I think Richard's story shows that at some times in his life, we were very definitely listened to, um, what we said mattered and was acted upon. But at other times, I think we quite clearly either weren't listened to or weren't even given the information that we needed in order to be able to say things that were useful. So I think it, it's absolutely vital that, that families, carers, care providers don't assume that they're always being told the full story. I, I think people need to be far more proactive than I was. Um, and R Richard, for example, had a superb care plan when he first went to Bonds Meadow. It was followed superbly and Richard was kept safe. Now, I made the, the massive mistake of assuming that the, because that care plan was there, was right for Richard, um, that it was going to stay there. And yet massive changes were made to it. If, if there'd been any sort of family conversation so that we would have been in a position to have been listened to, Richard would be alive today, I firmly believe. Yeah. So I think yeah. our families being listened to, in a lot of instances, no, they're jolly well not. Yeah. And so the vital thing is that families create the opportunities, make sure they ask the questions so that they can have their input and be kept in the loop. Yeah. That's right, because what's so difficult to hear, Sheila, and I've and I've picked it up from the comments as well in the in the QA, is that it so often seems to feel like a fight for families to be whereas in a in a way it was so obvious from listening to your story that you know when the team saw you as part of the team almost, as you know, as part of mm -hmm. of the of the support team for Richard, that's when things went well. Um and, and it was when you know when when you were really not that that things go wrong. And that it sounds like it was the same for Paula. I mean I'll talk a bit about that with her afterwards, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I just I, can I remember I... actually thinking at times, am I going to raise this? Should I fight on, on this issue or should I keep quiet? Because Richard's care home was, was a five minute drive from my house. Um, I was always terrified that if I kicked up too much of a fuss, um, he'd be, he would lose that placement and be moved miles away. And my family definitely didn't want that. So yes, it is a battle, you're right. Yeah. And let me just let's bring in Emily here. Emily, you know, Richard's sister, um, really, again, so grateful for you to be here. And let me just sort of introduce you and to say that you've, um, you've got, you know, a devastating perspective on this as, as, as his sister, but also I know you've been working for the last number of years on the LEADER programme, the Learning Disability Mortality Review programme. Um, so I just wanted to ask you what your what 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 your view is on, because this is 12, sort of 2012, so it's more than eight years ago that Richard died. Whether you think, you know, having been involved in all these reviews of the deaths of people with learning disabilities in, in, in England and knowing what happened to your brother, do you think lessons are learned or things have changed? I mean, what would you like to see happen? I actually really hate the phrase lesson learned because I, you know, we've done the learning. What we need to see now is change and we need to see action. Um, and I think Richard's story and Oliver's story are one of many. There are a number of other bereaved families um, who have signed into this webinar. And we know from the Learning Disability Mortality Review Programme that on average people with a learning disability are dying over 20 years younger than the general population. So we're not talking about unique scenarios with rogue nurses, rogue, doc rogue doctors. And, um, you know, we're talking about what is accepted as normal for people with a learning disability. And I think people make a lot of assumptions. You know, I don't know if people are familiar with the story of everybody, somebody, anybody and nobody. 
things need to change and every single one of us needs to be part of that change. And I've seen lots of really great examples in the chat of, of things that people are doing in their services. And I'd really like to invite people to think about what aren't you doing? What more could you be doing? Because at the moment, people are dying on average 20 years younger than the general population. If we don't radically change what we're doing now, the support that's available to people, how proactive we are, every person with a learning disability that we love, that we support, that we care for, that we work with, if we are a professional, is at risk of dying young. Um, and it's not, um, it's not people in mainstream services that needs to change. You know, if, if local services look at their learning disability caseload of, of people that they support, what's the average age in your team? Because if it's 20 years younger than the general population, then those of us working in learning disability services need to change our approach too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's, that is quite striking because it, it is true. It's so easy to think that needs somebody needs to be held to account. There needs to be, you know, and of course there must be. There must be an inquest in situations like this. Um, but also, you know, the learning from 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 the mortality reviews. It's something else out there that needs to change things. There needs to be a, I don't know, a, 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 a you know, reasonable adjustments by everybody. It's 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 easy to think it wouldn't happen to me, but. I have to say, I listened to Oliver's story. I've worked as a support worker in a learning disability service in a, in a home, and I can see how that might have happened on my watch. Yeah. You know, devastatingly so, but you know, so for people to take responsibility for that. So I wonder whether you want to say anything more about that, whether. Yeah, I think so. And, and shortly after Richard died, I, I was thinking very much about the care that was available to him. And I was thinking about the service that I was working in at the time. And I thought this could happen on my watch because of the way that we approach things. I'm a clinical psychologist and, and up to that point in my career, I thought, well, I specialise in mental health, so I'll trust other people to specialise in physical health. What do I know? Who am I to speak about this? But actually, whoever we are, whether we're a family member, whether we're a professional, physical health is our business. Um, we see risk assessment as our business. We see um, risk to others, risk to self as our bread and butter for everybody involved in learning disabilities. And physical healthcare has to be part of our bread and butter. Um, and I want everybody on this webinar to look back in one year and two year and five years and 10 years and be proud of what they did to contribute to this change rather than looking back and thinking that they could have or should have done more. That's what I have to do in, re in relation to looking back on Richard's life and what I could have and should have done more and you know every single person that's died has a family that is devastated and and things need to change thank you so much emily and and before we sort of move on sheila i wonder whether you have if there's one thing you want people to take away from this webinar and and, and um not so much learn because I, I hear what you're saying you know lessons learned is maybe just a bit of an empty phrase but what would you like people to change I think possibly the most massive change that needs to happen is that we move to a new phase where people with a learning disability, people with, an, with autism are viewed in such a way that their lives matter just as much as everybody else's life. And so they deserve exactly the same sort of care that the rest of us would expect to get in any situation and that things aren't let slide because oh this person's got a learning disability and it doesn't matter too much if they poo themselves every now and then for example um, let's treat everybody the same if we can move to that point i think we'll have jumped a big hurdle and lessons will actually start to be learned and the premature deaths will stop. Thank you so much, both you and Emily. That's all we've got time for now for the questions, but it is so thought provoking. I mean, the thought, you know, would you're right, are people valued equally? If if I smelled of poo, to put not too, too you know, <laughs> gentle a word on it, would people think, oh, well, you know, that's just how it is. Um, so really, thank you for making us think. And as I say, I will talk a little bit more with, with Sheila um, 
um, with, with, with Paula, sorry, afterwards. But before we do that, I just wanted to talk through some of the practicalities. I don't want to end this webinar with me talking with some slides about, you know, this, this, um, what's going to, all the practicalities. I want to end with, with Oliver and Richard's story. So let me just, um, just tell you now then, um, for today's webinar, you can download your certificate of attendance again from the website. And as usual, it would really help us if you could give us a donation, however small. Um, we are a small charity and we cannot keep these webinars go going if we don't have a, an income through your nation. So that would be really gratefully received. Our next webinar next month on the 13th of April um, is going to focus on do not resuscitate um, these issues and DNAR orders for people with learning disabilities. And actually, if you um, have some have an experience of um, people with learning disabilities receiving a DNAR order during COVID, which was maybe inappropriate. Could you please get in touch with us and share that before um, the next webinar? And we've also just opened nominations for the 2021 Linda McEnhill Awards, which is recognising best practice in end of life and bereavement support for people with learning disabilities. And also please hold the date for our annual conference, which will be held online on the 16th of September and, and details will follow about that. But now when we finish this, let's just go back to Oliver's story um, because it is quite, um, you know, both these stories are, are extraordinary and, and moving. And I just also want to stress they're not unique. Again, we can see that in the Q&A, some devastating you know, other other examples and stories have, have, have come up that there's a number of you watching this um, who have similarly devastating experiences. Um, so let's just go back to all of the story and, and my conversation with her just for the last 10 minutes um, before we finish. Lots of people watching this, I think, will already be familiar with the campaign, but there are also lots of people who are new to it. So do you want to explain a little bit, um, Paula, what that is? There was no huge thought processes behind Oliver's campaign. It came as a result of Oliver's inquest and it highlighted just how much our clinicians had a, no understanding or a very limited understanding of um, learning disability and also, also autism, there was no understanding of how to make the most basic of reasonable adjustments. And that, that clearly shone in Oliver's, you know, showed show through in Oliver's um, during the inquest when one of the um, doctors was asked, well, why didn't you make reasonable adjustments? And he said, you know, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I don't really know what it is. And he was, a, he was an excellent doctor, actually. And I, I looked at him and I thought, He's as much a victim as Oliver is because he's not had the training. And this is um, where Oliver's campaign was born. You know, with the reasonable adjustment, it's quite obvious if it's somebody who's a wheelchair user that it is quite reasonable to put in a lift, you know, right? Because you can't deliver the service if you turn on the first floor. But for people with learning disabilities and, and with autism, I think people just simply do not understand the staff what 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 the reasonable adjustments might be and 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 not understanding that without them you know like I, Oliver not wanting not sort of wanting to walk around for example when you talk about he wanted to walk around to cope with his you know it would be quite reasonable to let him would it not um, absolutely um you know I don't think the staff realize the importance of reasonable adjustments as well and not actually also that it's law yes this is yeah. the law yeah, yeah, yeah. Protect, um these communities of people, and it's their right that reasonable adjustments are made. If um, reasonable adjustments had have made, been made for Oliver, he could possibly still be alive today. So for Oliver, what would have been the key reasonable adjustments that you think might have saved his life? Oh, do you know, it's so simple. All they had to do first was talk to Oliver as a human being, as an equal to themselves, reassure Oliver. Throughout his time in the hospital, not one person thought to reassure him. Explain to him what was happening and why he was there. Remember, he was having seizures, but he was fully conscious, but a seizure was, would render him scared, anxious, um, and he'd be confused. Um, they, they were all talking over him. An autistic person generally needs, needs they, they need space. They need time to process information. 
they need that language modifying to meet his needs. He needed time to think and process. But most of all, you know, they needed to listen to him. They needed to read his hospital passport. They needed to talk to us. And we kept saying to them, um, Oliver's got a great sense of humour. Try to use humour. He was a huge um, Liverpool football fan. Engage in him in that way. Allow him space to walk around in between seizures. That's what he always did and that's what he needed. Um, you know, we've also got to remember, Oliver was a young teenage boy. A young teenage boy, how would they react in that situation without an additional need? I, I, I don't know, I haven't looked at my clock, but I think you spent about two minutes explaining this, right? That it's not time consuming, that's all, you know, doctors and nurses need to do is to listen to you for literally two minutes. You can you can explain so much and, and, and help, you know. So, so you really needed to have been part of that team. Helping. We were there, we were there the whole time. It's autistic people themselves and learning disabled people themselves. They can explain very, very well how best to help them. Mm. Um, and we, we must listen. We will never learn about autism first and or learning disability if we don't take our learnings from the very people who have autism, who have yeah. a learning disability. Yeah. Yeah. They can tell us that we talk about behaviour, challenging behaviour, what is challenging behaviour. Well, actually, you know, this is just communication. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And we need to listen to that. People are just trying to communicate their needs. They're yeah. trying to tell us what's happening. So I'd say it's not the it's not the learner disabled person or the autistic person that's got the challenging behaviour. Actually, it's the clinician who has the challenging behaviour because their their behaviour in due to lack of understanding is challenging the person with the with the learning disability and the autism. Yeah. So yeah. we need to be looking at things differently. I know, I know. People are thinking that actually, well, they were meant to die. I no, they weren't. They were pe the, the people who learn differently. I know. They weren't meant to die. The brain learns in a different way. Yeah, I know. Isn't wasn't wasn't that bit that Sheila said so shocking about the nurse saying it was his time to die? Oh, I mean, it's well, just how, how ignorant of that nurse. It's I mean, just shocking. It's just shocking. <laughs> Well, this is something I mentioned throughout all of the story on that recording, isn't it, um, about that, that when you had that ocular gyro crisis, would anybody else have been left for six months? I know, months? I know. And, 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 and they wouldn't. And um, I'll never forget that neurologist. I heard him in the doorway. And Oliver could hear everything. He's making it up. It's behavioural. She could have turned to us and said, does Oliver normally do these things? I mean, how you can show just the whites of your eyes for six hours with your mouth wide open is just unbelievable. All she had to do to it was ask us. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just... Um, but that is really striking because actually as you're talking now, I have a son who actually is probably exactly the same age as Oliver. He would have been 18 in 2016. Um, yeah, so, and, was he born in 1998? Yes, yes. April 1998. When okay. So, yeah, February 98. Yes, yeah, so, he's just a tiny bit older Same, same age. So I think you're right. I think if it was my son in that bed at the age of 18, being given medication and his eyes rolling back, I, know. I would not have the neurologist in the doorway saying, hey, I think I think Dom's making it up. I think he's not, you know. Yeah, I know. Yes, he was anxious and scared. And they, the, it was the catalyst of what they'd done to him. It doesn't matter what you know who or what people are. It's 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 that. I mean that to me is a sort of quite a striking image of imagining both our sons in the bed side by side, have both having the same reaction, same age, yeah. which they are. You know, and and really trying to understand what it is why she thinks it, Oliver is making it up it, and why she would think that for him. Well, let's think of a normal eighteen-year-old teenager. Say like your son went in with a broken leg. He's in pain, he's scared, he's frightened as an 18 year old. I, I'm going back that year for all of us, 17. So just, come, just coming into manhood really, I suppose. He goes in and anyone goes to touch him, he's gonna scream out, isn't he? He's gonna be, or he's, he's gonna show his teenage hormones. He might even swear, Oliver didn't, but he might swear. But would your son be given a psychotropic medication for that behavior? Yes. He wouldn't. Yes. Would. Whereas it's, it's yeah. okay to have given it to Oliver and whoever ever else because they've got labels attached to them. Yes. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't chemically restrain them. 
Yes, yes. And, and that's where the discrimination comes in. Mm. That's just making me feel really emotional there, Paul. I just the thought of that. I know, it's just... It's true, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's it true. is. Oh, gosh, Paula, we could talk for hours, couldn't we? There's so much to put, to, so much much to, put to right. And I'm methodical. Let's get Oliver's train and correct. Yeah. And let, yeah. let's get it exactly as we want to be. Then I can move on and do other things. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to be done. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for share, sharing that. And we will, we will end the webinar with that little music clip of all of it. You just want to explain a little bit what that music is. Oh, story, story, nice. Yes. So Oliver, being a typical teenager, um, I don't know why, I didn't know about this until after Oliver died. And Heather, Oliver's sister Heather was saying about, Oliver used to joke along with her to that song, take the nick out of it, because it's all fashioned, isn't it? Any teenager would. And then Heather put this video together, so the photographs of Oliver, and then when we heard the words in there, they would not listen, they would not, could not know how, perhaps they'll listen now, for they did not love you. And it, that sums up exactly what happened to Oliver. They wouldn't listen to him. In Oliver's death and Oliver's campaign, I hope they will listen to Oliver now. And that's what's important to Oliver and other learning disabled people, other autistic people. Let's hear their voices. Oliver has given his life up for this. He had to sacrifice his life in order for Oliver's campaign to come about, in order for the Oliver McGowan Magistry Training in autism, well, in, in learning disability and autism. He's had to lose his life for that. So let's give him the honour of listening to him. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not going to make you cry again. Starry, starry night. Paint your palette blue and grey Look out on a summer's day With eyes that know the darkness in my soul Shadows on the hills Sketch the trees and the daffodils Catch the breeze and the winter chills In colors on the snowy linen land What you tried to say to me And how you suffered for your sanity And how you tried to set them free They would not listen, they did not know how Perhaps they'll listen now Starry, starry night Flaming flowers that brightly blaze Swirling clouds in violet haze Reflect in Vincent's eyes of china blue Colors changing hue Morning fields of amber grain Weathered faces lined in pain Are soothed beneath the artist's loving hand now I understand what you tried to say to me and how you suffered for your sanity and how you tried to set them free they would not listen they did not know how perhaps they'll listen Thank you so much, Paula, Sheila, and thank you all for staying with us during this really quite devastating webinar. I'm just going to finish with two quotes. One is from one of you in, in, in the Q&A who said, it's not a one-off story. There are so many of us. We are a traumatically bereaved army. And this uh, webinar is going to go onto YouTube, onto our YouTube channel at six o'clock tonight. I'm just going to finish with something that Sheila and the Richard mother sent me by email yesterday. She said, two boys, two stories, two devastated families. It's not rocket science. It has to stop. Our boys deserve better. Thank you. <laughs>